Hello, hello. Okay, cool. My mic is on. And the right. Okay. Um, wow, full room. This is this is fantastic. Um, so for anybody who already knows me, uh, what's up? For everybody else, which is like everybody, uh, I'm Eric Bear. Um, so ooh, I'm going to reset this. So for the uh, kind of obligatory credentialing bit, I am the director of technology at a company called Livestock Nutrition Center. Yes, livestock as in cows, nutrition as in food, and center is the place that you get the food. We sell uh, livestock feed. Uh, before LNC, I spent about five years in Seattle with the fine folks at Formidable, working mostly for, uh, for Starbucks and for Walmart Labs, a smattering of others. And before that, um, I was at a video conferencing, video conferencing startup that really wishes it was Zoom. Um, let's make sure these advance. There we go. Okay, with that out of the way, uh, let's dig in. So I'm sure at least a few of you have heard about the three hardest things in computer science, uh, caching and uh, off by one errors, or if you are working in JavaScript, that's caching and floating point arithmetic. So today I do not want to talk about floating point arithmetic because I never want to talk about floating point arithmetic. Today, uh, I want to talk about caching and specifically HTTP caching as it relates to GraphQL. Um, so I want to start off by talking about HTTP caching in general, uh, and I'm going to loop back to the GraphQL part uh, in just a little bit. So what is HTTP caching? Um, so when you make an HTTP request, it travels th from, through anywhere from about two to maybe a half dozen intermediate pieces of software, and each of these layers can return a cached response if one is available. So, for example, uh, imagine a kid looking for her Avengers Marvel Legends series endgame power gauntlet with articulated electronic fist. She might start by bothering the closest adult around. That's, uh, that's uh, we'll call him Papa Local. He's sitting right there in the room. He says, uh, ask your mom. And uh, mom is somewhere in the region. Uh, she scampers from room to room yelling mom really loudly. And mom says, uh, you'll have to go ask your sister Proxy, uh, who probably knows what it is. So in, in a real application, uh, Papa Local is the, the browser cache. Um, there is an HTTP cache built into all uh, browsers, uh, mobile platforms, anything that in implements HTTP. I'm calling it a browser cache just so that we don't confuse it with the application cache that uh, is implemented in something like Relay uh, or, uh, or Apollo Client. Those are, that's, a, that's a different thing. So this is an HTTP level thing. Um, so browser cache. Uh, oops, the next one is, uh, is your uh, region. So this is typically a CDN, an API gateway. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of ways to sort of uh, field requests uh, in a region. Uh, they're typically very inexpensive. Cloudflare CDN is great. Uh, CloudFront is great. Fastly is great. There's a bunch of them. They're all pretty great. Um, and then finally, you've got your proxy. Uh, so uh, this one's interesting. Even for a simple single server, uh, application, you'll most often have your traffic going through a reverse proxy server. Um, these things uh, are, are mostly f fuss free, they're transparent, uh, but they do all kinds of things. They, they'll terminate TLS, um, they uh, serve static files to take some load off your actual application server, and most importantly, uh, they do request caching. So if none of these layers have the, um, have the version of the request that you're looking for, it actually reaches your application server. There's no more free lunch, uh, and you have to build your own cache, you know, whatever it is that, that you've chosen to implement. Um, I like nested dolls, uh, but for the youths, um, we'll call this our cache stack. Um, so you can remove the CDN, you can add an API gateway, you can add proxy layers like Varnish and, and some other things, uh, but they all work basically the same. Uh, it's either, um, uh, at a minimum, you'll have the caching, the HTTP cache that comes with your HTTP, HTTP transport. I'm going to be so glad to not say HTTP again after this. Um, and you'll almost certainly deploy behind a proxy server, so you'll probably have at least two. Um, the big fat can't miss it detail here, though, is that HTTP caching is baked into the platform and that none of this needs to be configured or, or maintained. It's, uh, this has been true since Bill Clinton was president. It, it, it's a part of the HTTP 1.1 spec. It's been around, I think, since 99. Um, so this caching stuff, it's free, as in left pad, and it's at its most basic level, all you need to do is make sure that your server is sending the, the cache control header uh, in its response. Yeah, there are a few other headers um, uh, before you, you get upset about that. The e-tag is really important, but this is all kind of an optimization. Once you're sending cache control, you're, you're in really good shape. Um, so the cache control header can have multiple parts. Each one is called a directive. 
Um, here are all the parts uh, for um, a cache control header that's sent back by a server. Uh, broadly speaking, there are um, two types. There's how do you want to store the data, if at all, and then there's um, how do you want to deal with freshness and, and revalidation. And uh, definitions are boring, so we'll start with examples. Um, if a HTTP cache implementation received this header, it says, okay, there, cache control exists, therefore I will use a cache in some form. And then it says max age. Uh, this says it will cache that request uh, for one hour starting the moment the request was made. After that hour is up, uh, the data is considered stale and would be refetched. It may or may not purge uh, automatically depending on the implementation. Uh, and then the private directive just says, uh, this is user-specific data. Don't store it in anywhere public like a CDN, uh, some sort of shared resource. Um, it's important to note that just because you mark it as private doesn't mean it's uncacheable. Um, your HTTP implementation on the client's actual device uh, will still very likely uh, um, cache that request um, if you set the correct headers. Um, this one uh, is a little bit more interesting. Again, cache control shows up. And then we have this weird combination of max age zero and must revalidate. That says that every time the data is requested, uh, the server sends a special uh, request to see if the data is still usable uh, before it returns the cache result. Uh, and then again, uh, public versus private. This just marks it as uh, able to be cached uh, in a CDN layer or some, some public data structure. This uh, is the exact cache but revalidate header that, you, uh, that Netlify uses to ensure uh, fresh content on every deploy. Um, just thought it was kind of a cool how they did that. Um, you can also set the cache control header on the request. Uh, there are kind of there are a few interesting things you can do. You can send a, a no store directive, uh, which just says uh, don't store anything about this, regardless of what the server tells you. Um, these are all good to know about. It's good to know what tools are available to you. But for the most part, all you need is uh, is the the header on the response. So we are all on the same page now about HTTP's caching. Uh, all we have to do is generate our header with the server of your choice, like uh, uh, using Apollo cache ints or something something similar. This is not going to work, uh, not how you think. And um, unfortunately, when it comes to caching, it's, it's a little bit hard to, to debug. So uh, I've definitely been in situations where people thought caching was implemented and everything worked. They set their header. Uh, and then when you, you do your testing, you find that uh, nothing is actually uh, getting cached. So um, the default behavior uh, of most GraphQL clients is to abuse HTTP. That's why this doesn't work. Specifically, clients send get information in a post request. And sometimes they even mutate data in a GET request. Both of these are possible to do uh, with the GraphQL client. The GraphQL Apollo server, I believe, rejects uh, GET requests that have mutations in them. But it, it's going to be server dependent. Um, yeah, how many, of, how many people in this room um, use uh, POST requests for, for, all, for all queries? Yeah, that's, like, uh, that's everybody, uh, just about. Uh, so, like, what's what's the deal with this? Uh, I mean, it goes against a lot of tech dogma and whatever. But is this just like a bunch of dorks being pedantic, or like, does it matter? Like, what's what's the problem? Um, so, speaking of dorks, I read the spec, and uh, the HTTP POST section says um, responses to uh, the POST method are not cacheable unless they send the appropriate cache control header or expires header fields. So I don't know. I mean, from this, things should work fine, right? You should technically be able to cache a post request. Um, there is actually another section of the spec that muddies the water a little bit. But the bigger problem is that this is a huge foot gun. And as such, very few HTTP caches actually implement it. So while it's possible, nobody does. And if you look at uh, some of the common ones, you'll find that all of them cache get. Some of them cache options and head. None of them cache post, at least not by default. Um, but why are we using post to get things in the first place? Mumble mumble something URL link, I don't know. So if you look at the spec here, it says there's no limit on URL length, which by the way is, is a, a part of the request line, so that's what this means. Um, and it also says they recommend support of at least 8,000 octets. And if you don't know what an octet is, it's, uh, it's eight bytes, uh, or sorry, eight bits, which is a byte, and a byte is an ASCII character. So this is roughly gonna be um, 8,000 uh, characters in, in a URL string. Uh, yeah, some characters are, are, are two bytes, but just let's keep this kind of simple. Um, so it uh, basically says this is the recommendation, but it's largely unspecified. So what does it look like out in the wild? Um, why, are we, why are we doing this? 
Um, I started in Node. Uh, interestingly, uh, Node 12 took the limit from uh, 80 down to just 8 kilobytes, but still 8 kilobytes. I mean, that's the recommendation. 8,000 bytes is, uh, is, is quite a lot. Uh, and after some complaints, um, a lot of complaints, uh, Node 12 made that configurable. So there's no actual limitation here. Um, I wrote a little script and poked at my uh, daily driver, which is Brave, uh, and I hit about 15,000 characters before I got an error. Um, Google and Firefox work. Shockingly, Safari works OK. Um, I downloaded the new Chromium-based uh, Microsoft Edge. It handles uh, even more than Chrome. So what's the problem? Why are we, why are we doing this? Um, the problem is the same thing that it's always been. <laughs> Internet Explorer. It's always Internet Explorer. Um, now, um, I will say, this is sort of an aside, and I didn't really intend to talk about this, but um, Internet Explorer is the last version. Internet Explorer 11 is the last version of Internet Explorer, uh, and it will go end of life when uh, Windows 10 goes end of life, which I believe is 2025. Not that the usage statistics are, are there to show that we need to support this in a meaningful way, uh, but just so you kind of know, have a sense of the timeline uh, and the taper and like when the hard cutoff is. Um, anyway, here's the thing. We have had problems with Internet Explorer forever, for decades. And we never really solved the problem by accepting the lowest common denominator. That was never the approach. The web has a long history of hacking around IE, which, I mean, kind of, I mean, it kicked off a long time ago, but but kicked off in earnest with jQuery. jQuery wrapped up all the crazy crap that, that Internet Explorer did and made it easy to use. And now we have Babel, we have Babel preset env, and in, in any modern code base, we write code uh, with the best tools available and we fall back only if necessary. So if we were to write some sort of fallback, we would get all the benefits of GraphQL and totally obviate all of the limitations that people talk about when it comes to HTTP caching. What I'm saying that cacheability versus broad client support is a false choice. And this is a really big deal. Uh, there are four sessions at this year's uh, GraphQL Summit on caching. Uh, what I'm saying, this, this invalidates a foundational premise of all of the GraphQL clients. Uh, um, uh, Apollo server uh, lets you toggle between get and post, but not, not on a per request basis. Relay lets you pass in a fetch implementation. I don't really know what people are, are, are doing there. Uh, Urkel doesn't let you ta uh, change the behavior at all. Every, all of the clients just assume post. So um, the, the big deal here is that this opens the door to all of the tooling that, that uh, people who maintain APIs already want to use. So could it work? Uh, yes, it can, and I'm running it in production today. Um, there is, this is about 13 lines of code. It's, it's, uh, this is pseudocode-ish. There's a little more you'd want to do. Uh, but there is a, there's a specific HTTP error code uh, for when a request URI is too long. It's, it's uh, 414. It's called request URI too long. Uh, and in practice, I found a lot of browsers through a 413 instead, which was request too large. But I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that like 13 ho lines of code here uh, 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 do this fallback, and it's not very difficult. Um, and the best thing about a fallback like this is that the cost is basically zero, because the thing that's going to fail is the client. So it's going to fail in zero to three milliseconds it, before it even uh, makes a network request. Most likely, it's not your server that's going to have the limitation. So um, the only thing you really want to do in a production environment is, is have some way to toggle between uh, post and get, whether you do that by, by analyzing the query itself uh, or by having two separate methods, like a, a dot query and a dot, dot mutation. Um, so both uh, Apollo Client and Relay allow you to do this. Apollo Client, you kind of have to, to hack it a little bit. Um, Relay, uh, you pass in your fetching implementation. Um, but you, you can do this today. So what did we learn? We learned that HTTP caching is awesome. We learned that HTTP caching is easy and that we can do it. We learned that cacheability versus broad client support is a false choice. And that uh, HTTP caching in GraphQL APIs is possible today. So this whole mess about why are we about you know hand implemented caching, uh, you can kind of take at least some of that off the table. So, 14 minutes and four seconds of 15 minutes. So that's all I have. This is it. Thank you all for coming out, and thank you for the organizers. This was a great event. <laughs>